Good afternoon and thank you for joining our webcast. I'm Keith Fung, Executive Editor at Multi-Housing News Magazine and I will be your moderator today. A large amount of low-income housing tax credit, LIHTC and other affordable housing properties are coming to the end of their life cycles and need recapitalization if they are to continue existing as affordable housing. Recapitalization is of interest to many affordable housing players today and our thanks also to NeighborWorks America which helped us in identifying this topic. Our seminar today will present the what's, how's and why's of preser preserving and recapitalization, recapitalizing light tech and affordable housing. We are pleased to present our panel of four speakers. The first speaker, David Smith, will provide an exposition of the subject, followed by Andrew Davenport. David Schultz and Joshua Rees, who will go into further details from the for-profit developers, non-profit developers, and the lenders' points of views, respectively. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website, along with the PDFs, which the speakers are kindly making available to the audience. More information regarding retrieving these materials um, will be provided at the end of the webinar. As far as questions, you will see a window on your screen in which you can type questions. Feel free to type and submit questions at any time during the webinar. We will try to have some time for Q&As towards the end of the webinar when we will try to address as many of the questions as possible. We're honored to introduce our first speaker, David Smith, founder and chairman of Recap Advisors. David will present an exposition of the topic and offer observations drawing from his years of deep experience in the field. What are the reasons for recapitalization? What are the features of affordable housing properties that are in need of recapitalization? How to acquire affordable housing needing preservation? and how to recapitalize and preserve such affordable housing. These are some of the topics David will walk you through. For nearly four decades as Recap's founder and chairman, David has been a national and now global innovator, entrepreneur, and thought leader in affordable housing. Recap, now approaching its 25th year, has been recognized as the nation's best at spotting, designing, and executing replicable transaction models in this field. David and Recap have led the invention of workouts, 1970s, resyndication, 1982 to 85, preservation, 1988 to 96, mark to market, 1996 to 2002, renewed affordability, 2001 to today, and most recently, public housing projects via the RAD demonstration program. Recap and David also maintain a longstanding commitment to professional education, pro bono public advice and service to the affordable housing community. Aside from being a speaker or co-chairman at hundreds of conferences and participant in multifamily industry regulator working groups, David has provided high quality analysis to Congress, the Millennial Housing Commission, CBO, HUD, state HFAs, foundations and others. Policy makers seek out David because he places his deep knowledge and expertise in service to public policy goals by developing effective, executable solutions and new affordable housing tools, legislation and financial products. In 1996, he was one of 10 individuals selected by the Senate Housing Subcommittee as a working group to develop mark-to-market -mark legislation enacted in 1998 to overhaul the rental debt structure of more than 450,000 HUD apartments with a $12 billion estimated value nationwide. With more than 300 published articles in real estate valuation and policy periodicals, plus three real estate related books, David Wright's recaps most must read electronic periodical state of the market as well as the guru is in a monthly column for tax credit advisor his leadership innovation and commitment have been recognized in awards from the american appraisal association nairo uh, that's uh, nahro commercial property executive magazine and national housing and rehabilitation association Beyond Recap, David is also the founder and CEO of the 501, uh, 501c3 Global Nonprofit Affordable Housing Institute. 
recipient of two grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, AHI has delivered impact in Brazil, Colombia, Egypt, Haiti, India, Ireland, Kenya, Mexico, Mongolia, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Tunisia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, and United Kingdom. We thank David for being on our panel. Um, David, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. In this presentation, I have a task that is in some sense impossible because I have to explain a complicated business to you. So I'm going to aim for three simpler goals. The first one is I'm going to try to enable you to identify when a property that you might encounter in some form or fashion is one worth learning more about for purposes of potentially doing uh, a recapitalization or tax credit transaction. Uh, secondly, uh, in addition to when you should get alert, I'll try to give you a sense of what you should be alert for. And third, in as much as I can, I will try to make it possible for you to be less confused by all of the jargon in our industry. Um, it's a secret. But we in the industry use jargon to keep outsiders out and to make fun of people who don't speak it right. And I will try to minimize the extent to which you are susceptible to that. So the first thing that you need to understand is that to enter this webinar is not unlike turning on Game of Thrones at the beginning of season five. There are hundreds of players with different particular roles. And they all operate on basically one principle, which everyone knows and no one admits, that the deal is a device to produce fees, and that housing or improved housing is a useful byproduct. Um, there are four major families or households. There are something called allocators, which I'll talk about briefly. There are developers, for-profit and non-profit. We have captured two of them and present them here for your edification. There are investors, and I will extend that to include lenders and capital providers. We have one of those. And there are intermediaries. Now, LIHTC, first thing of jargon, you have to pronounce it LIHTC. Pronouncing it any other way casts you as an outsider. Comes in two flavors. One is allocated, sometimes called 9%. And one comes out of volume cap bonds. It's sometimes called 4%. For your purposes, the simplified thing to know is that if you win a LIHTC allocation, that represents, for our purposes, basically free money for 55 or so percent of total development cost. And if you win a volume cap allocation, as a, as a bonus prize, you win about 25 percent of development cost. Now, those are not additive. You can only have one or the other with respect to any dollar of, of of investment. And the thing about the light tech business today is that like Game of Thrones, things are tough. Light tech is incredibly scarce. Volume cap is plentiful. So here's your first indicator. If you see a of opportunity to gain volume cap, you should perk up because most states can, can give it away. Next, deals, raw material is scarce syndicators, an intermediary not present on this call, are plentiful and, sad to relate, developers are plentiful. And what that means is that syndicators and developers are on a hunt for deals, for LIHTC, and for volume cap. Okay. This is a slide that you will want to look at later when you download the PDF. Basically, there is a life cycle of deals that begins with a pre-intelligent state and ends with a poor schlub humped over a computer attempting to uh, calculate whether it's time to do a recapitalization. The dates on the left-hand side represent the beginning of construction. So you will see um, the beginning of occupancy. You will see in step five that I've labeled that year zero. I'll come back to that. That moment, occupancy, the fifth step, the fifth phase in the life cycle, is actually when the tax credits start to flow. And everything that happens in the previous stages represent the development finance that brings the capital in in order to trigger the tax credits. 
once you get to the to occupancy, several other things happen, and I will jump ahead to step seven, which is that in year 15, that's a term you're going to hear about again and again, in year 15, you can go redo it. Before step five, there are four steps that you will hear talked about. There is something called a QAP, which is a qualified allocation plan. It's created by a state. It exists to say, we have this free money to give out. Would you like some? Here is what we want. Typically, that will be established 24 months before occupancy of a project that gets developed under that QAP. About six months later, the allocator will pick the winners from among the applications. About three months after that, there will probably be a closing where that allocation of tax credits gets sold for cash. I'm sure our developer types will talk about that. Then there will be a closing where lots of papers are signed and intermediaries get paid fees. And then in round numbers, over the course of 12 months, plus or minus, the property will be developed, renovated, uh, it will receive its certification, and it will eventually get its certificate of occupancy, and that brings us back to step five. It's important to note that most people will divide this into the first four phases, which are the development phase. Phases five through seven are the holding period phase, and seven and eight represent the, gosh, this was just so much fun, let's do it again and recapitalize. Now, the reason this chart is so important is right now in these United States of ours, for all practical purposes, if you don't get LIHTC, you can't make your, day, your deal work. So everyone who plays in this space is acutely conscious of the QAP cycles, the volume cap cycles, the price of credits, and so on. Okay, now, next thing you need to understand is that most of what we're is dealt with, and, and for our purposes, since you're dealing with recapitalization, you're dealing with things that are obsolete. Uh, the picture that you can see there um, actually represents an actual developer at the time he did his first deal in 1974 when he was a HEP cap. And many of these folks still own their same transaction, somewhat remarkably. Um, it's also important to understand that, of course, just as the glasses are bad, the mustache is bad, the leisure suit is bad, there's a variety of reasons why that old property needs to be redone. And so when you find something that looks anachronistic, that's your second tip. If it looks like it's out of date, think of it as raw material for an upgrade. Now, affordable housing finance. I've dealt with people from the conventional world a lot who, sort, who tend to look down their nose at affordable housing finance because somehow they feel like it's not real macho real estate. Well, actually it is. It's just more complicated for less money. The government intervenes in much the manner of a chaperone by both protecting the customers, meaning low-income housing tenants, um, the customers and the taxpayer, and by assuring that those people get a rent bargain in some form or fashion, and I'm sure our developers and our lender will talk about that. So inherent in tax credit is the idea that there's a rental advantage. Now, if you have are going to have a rental advantage on one side, on the other side, the government provides resources to make up that lost economic value. So what the government taketh away with its left hand, it giveth with the right hand. And the government being a large Frankensteinian kind of entity, the left hand and the right hand don't always work together, so sometimes the numbers are better and sometimes they are worse. Meanwhile, there are three periods of time that I alluded to in the previous slide that I will allude to again. From and after occupancy, for the first 10 years, the investor is getting the benefit. That's the delivery period. Okay, 10 years of delivery. From year 10 to year 15, there is a period of time where no benefits are being delivered, but there is a potential for recapture of credits if the owner violates the rules. By year 15, that recapture has dropped to zero. So from and after year 15, the investors are no longer motivated to be in the transaction that we will deal with their exit in a second. However, at a minimum, 
to get this 10-year cookie, which we're going to turn into cash through syndication, you must sign a 30-year extended use agreement, which means that between year 15 and year 30, the project has certain characteristics of a zombie, at least the limited partners do, because they are indifferent. Some use agreements, as in California and elsewhere, go out 55 plus years. The relevance of that is that even though they go out that long period of time, it is still possible to do a new tax credit transaction because there will normally be a certain amount of headroom in the deal. Lastly, to go back to our delightful picture up there, every one of these transactions is custom tailored. He didn't buy that off the rack. That uh, was designed for him to fit his specification. The capital stack, as I'm sure our lender will talk about, is incredibly complicated. Every junior lien that gets put on, every junior financing has a mortgage or a collateral associated with it. It gets very complicated. And just like that leisure suit, not only does it become out of date, it doesn't fit anymore. And so by year 15, it's time for custom tailoring, which leads to the next important idea. Preservation, development, is never permanent. In the grand recapitalization hotel, people come, people go, and we do it all over again. Because it is a reality of a residential real estate that these things need an upgrade every 10 to 15 years. But I just said a moment ago that the capital stack that we're dealing with is very inflexible. So to do the upgrade, to change the physical configuration, you must put new financing in. And remember, the last 15 years, we've had the broadband revolution. Before that, we had the microwave revolution. Also in the last 15 years, we've had green and sustainability. We've had a continuing fragmentation of what constitutes the nuclear household in the United States. For that matters because that means we have different subcategories of tenants and different floor plans we need. The other thing that happens in 15 years is that markets rise and fall. So what was a good affordability bargain when we wrote those contracts is no longer a good affordability bargain. It goes back and forth. Meanwhile, in the 15 years, partners change, incentives diverge. The investors, most of the investors who consume those tax credits don't exist anymore because they were banks that were bought by banks that were bought by other banks that were bought by Bank of America and City that were recapitalized um, by TARP, and here we all are again. So there's a lot of stuff in the bank's garage. Uh, general partners, uh, whether they're corporate or individual, age, change focus, change capacity, become crotchety. Lots of things become obsolete. And the change of the accumulation or amortization of loans, the hard loans amortize down, soft loans accrete up, means that nothing fits anymore. So as somewhere between year 10 and year 15, it becomes increasingly necessary from the real estate's point of view to do something. But not everybody gets that. I've been describing the tax credit model. The tax credit doesn't cover all the properties in the United States. My best estimate is that we have between four and five million units that have some form of affordability covenant. And many of them are, for our purposes, orphans. And here's another place for you to watch for things. If you see a property that is physically obsolete, nine times out of uh, affordable property, public housing, HUD, uh, nonprofit, whatever. If it's physically obsolete, nine times out of ten, it's because it has over-engineered financing. And it has a use agreement that doesn't work anymore. And it has enforcement mechanisms that are toothless because of those zombie limited partners I talked about. And the incentives of the general partner and the limited partners have become misaligned. Lots of people are demotivated. And despite all that, they're barriers to exit. And you say, gee, that's a lot of fun. And here are the cons. Legacy public housing used to be an orphan until the rental assistance demonstration program got created. There are 1.3 million units of legacy public housing. Only 180 plus thousand of them are currently in RAD, but even though that's a tremendous amount, that leaves a lot behind. If you ever encounter something called a Section 202 elderly, they would, these would have been built in the 60s and 70s. The residents will be uh, have lived there pretty much the entire time. The board of the 202 will be older than the residents. That's a candidate. RHS stands for Rural Housing Service, with the artist formerly known as the Farmers Home Administration. They had a program called Section 515, and very few of those have been recapitalized. And they're interesting because you can become urban without moving, 
what was a suburb 40 years ago or the countryside is now part of the Los Angeles glob. There are HUD projects, there are post-preservation projects with unpronounceable acronyms ELIPA and LIPRA, and there are LITEC deals done 15 years ago and LITEC deals done 30 years ago. And all of these properties need to be adopted, and if you remember from the first slide, deals are devices to produce fees, that means a fee opportunity. So, what do you want to be? You want to be legitimate, you want to be capable, you want to be durable, you want to be scalable, you want to be smart, and you want to have friends who can give you resources. So preservation has become the preferred acquisition strategy for many a developer, such as Michael's. Um, it's convenient. You can do it with other people's money. You can get a new round of development fees. You can re-syndicate your own deal. What fun. Um, you have to buy the property from the current owners for a price that gets negotiated. You can partner with housing authorities. That's the RAD business. We talked about that. I should mention that our company, Recap Advisors, was the pioneer in RAD. And I'm pleased to report that our head of RAD, uh, Tom Davis, uh, recently transitioned from Recap Advisors to be head of the Office of Recapitalization at HUD. So he went from Recap to the Office of Recap. Um, and we're currently negotiating with HUD the amount of royalty they get, they pay us for the trademark infringement. You can also buy trouble. I have made, I have created wealth consistently by buying stuff that other people would pay you to take over and then fixing it. Yes, that takes risk tolerance and speed, it works. You also have to find juice. You have to find some form of resource to close the cost value gap, and there are a variety of those. And the popular sources of material right now are old public housing via RAD, stuff that never got touched by the tax credit in inventory, which is reaching year 40, and those post-preservation projects. Now, if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. And instead, it's a marine-style obstacle course, where whatever doesn't kill you earns you your development fee, we think. First problem, getting a deal that is viably priced. Some folks I know will look at 100 and run the numbers on 50 before they get one that's viably priced. Many things are listed by real estate brokers, and they get priced up. So if you want a buying advantage, you have to find situations where real risk is less than perceived risk. Next, you have to win LITEC, um, which means you have to know what the QAP says. Uh, indeed, you may want to try to influence the QAP because it's published prospectively uh, for public comment. Um, and in most states, demand for LITEC outseeds supply by three to one. To file an application that has a chance of winning costs a lot of money in third parties, and the winning deals have to pay for the two losers. So this is a barrier to entry. Um, selling the LITEC is a challenge. It's not really a barrier to entry, but it can be bewildering because everybody wants to buy your deal. Everybody says they can promise things. Everybody discovers that the market moves while you're negotiating it. It's very easy to get frustrated. Um, even with all of that, you'll have to find some soft debt. And I will not go into this because I anticipate our developers were, will. There will be a listing of a development fee uh, in the sources and uses, but you will become familiar with something called a deferred development fee, which is an IOU from yourself to yourself. And with that, I will turn it back to Keith and back to the first developer who succeeded in doing this. Thank you so much, David, and thank you so much for your great exposition. I know the um, within a very short time frame, you have to um, you know cover all that in a um, short time. All right, so thanks again, and we are pleased to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Davenport, Vice President at Michael's Development Company. Uh, Mr. Davenport will represent the for-profit developer's perspective on the panel. He will discuss analyzing projects for preservation and demonstrate uh, via two case studies how the Michaels organization made these preservation deals work. As Vice President, Andrew is involved in all aspects of housing development at Michaels, including secure, securing financing, conducting community outreach, and working with housing authorities, finance agencies, community partners, and the development team to bring complete complex affordable housing developments from concept to reality. Andrew is currently involved with projects in Newark, Camden, and Mount Laurel, New Jersey, 
which include mixed use and affordable development. Prior to joining Michael's development in uh, 2011, Andrew was a development officer with Penrose Properties, where he was responsible for two multi-phased Hope 6 redevelopment projects. In Pennsylvania, Andrew's uh, project portfolio encompassed a wide variety of development projects, including mixed income and mixed finance transactions, general occupancy and senior occupancy developments, new construction and rehabilitation, and rental and for sale housing. Prior to his work at Penrose, he was Assistant Director of Real Estate Operations for the City of Philadelphia's Office of Housing and Community Development, where he coordinated disposition of publicly held property for real residential and commercial development. Andrew holds a Bachelor of Arts um, degree in political science from Middlebury College and a Master of Government Administration from the University of Pennsylvania. In 2000, he was selected and served as a fellow in the New York City Department of Correction in the New York City Urban Fellows Program. We welcome Andrew to the webinar. Andrew, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um... There we are. I hope everyone can see uh, my presentation. I'll, again, as as uh, Keith discussed, I want to talk about how you know specifically as a for-profit developer, we look at projects um, for preservation. And um, David covered a lot of information, and hopefully, I'm going to just talk about some of the key elements we look at. Now, there are two types of projects that I'm looking at, and one is acquisition, and one is uh, portfolio investment. Those are things that that Michaels is already involved with. So first, going into acquisitions, we or I look at three different key criteria: the market, the market for that asset, for that that development that's that's up for an opportunity for an acquisition for preservation. Um, and I, I have a lot of different ways I think about this, but one of them I want it in a good market, but nothing too good. And um, I also don't want it in a bad market. I don't want it. Um, to be in a, a really negative area, and that's for multiple reasons. But um, one of them is is if it's in a really good market, I'm probably not going to be able to afford it for an acquisition rehab or or, or a preservation project. I generally refer to them as as ac rehabs or acquisition rehabs. Um, and as as David had mentioned, when it goes through a broker, and that's those are generally your good market areas. I'm not going to probably be able to afford it um, at the end of the day. But if it's in a terrible market, I'm not going to want it. It's not probably not going to be able to pencil out um, or even uh, meet its appraised value and, and, and appraisal. And what you purchase the property for, and in all these scenarios, you're going to be purchasing the property. Um, its, its value is very important because you can generate credits on the acquisition. And you may be able to finance that acquisition with some kind of soft debt, a seller's note or something else that becomes really important. So the appraised value is extremely important in these in these uh, preservation projects. The second thing I'm looking at is how is that property working today? How are its existing operations? If it's running in the red in a catastrophic way and or there's no subsidy to help get it through, that makes it a very uh, unattractive um, acquisition. If, however, there's a subsidy source that'll come with it, or there's an opportunity to maximize operations or, or rents, that I can make it pencil better and operate, you know, run in the black and support some debt in a positive way, then that makes it a much more attractive acquisition opportunity. And the third are, what are the local opportunities? And this is kind of a catch-all but the first thing I'm going to look at, and, and David basically said the 9% is just too competitive, 9% credit is too competitive for most preservation projects. And in most cases, I'd probably say that's true. Um, so I want to make sure that that locality has volume cap credits available, or really volume cap for the, the taxes and debt necessary to do the acquisition rehab, and that there's other ways to work it up. Um, out in the local opportunity. If, it, if maybe it's got volume cap and there's a decent shot of a 9%, that makes it a more attractive project. Um, if it's a municipality that is really willing to work on a soft source for an asset that they want to see preserved, or uh, they're willing to provide help with a pilot or something else, those are all considerations I'm going to, I'm going to take into a uh, into place when looking at an acquisition opportunity. If they've got debt on a project, 
um, you know, from something when it was originally constructed for an affordable project, are they willing to work with that? Because that can, you know, how that existing get gets restructured can play an important part on the on the preservation project, as as David kind of alluded to with the existing liens. So the example of that, and one we're doing now, is uh, the Pleasant View Gardens project we're doing in Baltimore with the housing authority there, and um, in that one, this was a really nice um, kind of Hope Six development built in 1997. So it's not that old, um, in an up-and-coming market. It's in kind of the Johns Hopkins area, so there's been a lot of uh, positive pressure and a lot of other development going on in the area that would, would normally maybe put this in, in, a, in, a, in an overly competitive market. However, because it's a public housing development it has and was built with a lot of other public money, it's got a lot of uh, income and use restrictions. So that has that two-edged sword. One, it will appraise significantly. It generates a lot of acquisition credits that we're really relying on. And at the same time, it operates. It's not, it's in an area, um, but those restrictions make it unattractive to other buyers. Um, and it's it's not eligible for a market rate conversion or some of the other things that, that other people might be attracted as, you know, as competitors for that acquisition opportunity. Um, in that second criteria, and, and David talked about this a little bit, is the RAD conversion with a 20-year with, with contract. This is coming in with subsidy that really makes the taxes and financing possible. I, I'm going to have um, a RAD contract, which is basically a Section 8 contract for 20 years, and unlike public housing, it's not, you know, it's, it's not at that same risk of, of giant variances in the amount of operating subsidy we're going to get. It, it'll pencil out and carry a significant amount of new debt, which, again, since I'm not looking for that ultra-competitive 9% credit and I can do this with tax-exempt bonds and 4% uh, credits, it, it becomes a very, um, very attractive property. And then, as I mentioned, the local opportunities. The city's, you know, express well, you know, is providing a pilot to us as they had um, when it was authority owned. It is, um, we have a supportive partnership with the housing authority and working to get that kind of local support and working with the existing residents and everything else. So that's extremely important. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of existing soft debt. This was built in 1997 with a with substantial amounts of uh, loans from the state the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. We're working with them to properly restructure those so that they don't prohibit us from doing the preservation and the rehab necessary to keep this property running for another 15, 20 years. Um, and so those kind of three things coalesce into what, what to me is a very attractive um, preservation opportunity. And to talk briefly about a portfolio acquisition, we look at very similar things but these are properties that we already um, developed that because of where they are, they, they're, they're, they might be ready for preservation or acquisition rehab. Um, specifically, they might be ready for acquisition rehab with, with, with tax credits. And timing and capital needs. This is when we kind of start looking at our own portfolio like, well, is it time to do something with uh, this property? And so the timing, the, the events that, that David mentioned are all critical to us. Is it a, 50, a year post 15, or is coming on to a post 15 year property? Are we about to be out of our initial compliance period for uh, tax credits? And is the existing investor looking to get out? So that's, there's a perfect opportunity to recapitalize, to refinance a project. Secondly, um, other things that we encounter is there are mortgage balloon payment or is the mortgage uh, term coming up? Is it time to refinance an existing mortgage that's on the property that we will be able to do that? Um, and with that, uh, occasionally we also see, oh, is our subsidy changing? Are we at a 20 year, you know, we had a 20 year half contract, are we about to renegotiate that, um, hopefully extend it for another 20 years? Is that another good opportunity for us to go through the acquisition rehab process, go get the 4% volume cap and, and, and pursue this as a, as a preservation deal. So those kind of are some three critical items that uh, point us towards uh, a preservation or ac ac rehab project. With that is the capital needs. Ha does the property need 
a significant amount of work that we can't cover with existing reserves, with existing operations, is, you know, it may not, we may not be facing any of these, those other deadlines per se, but it just becomes time to address some of the capital needs in the project, and can we do that with, with, uh, with an ACT rehab uh, refinance um, or recapitalization. So associated with that, the other things we're going to look at are the alternative financing opportunities. So with our properties, you know, it may be that um, we can achieve some of these goals with a more simple FHA refinance with, on, on some existing debt. That may be something we can do. Some of the other um, opportunities might be there. Are, we analyze those into the mix. How competitive is it going to be in that area? You know, we own properties in 33 states, so we have to look at each state's QAP and analyze, well, uh, how difficult is it to get 9%? Maybe that's possible if, if a property has that big of a need. Um, if that's not possible, how, how difficult is it to get 4% credits and, and volume cap? How, how competitive is it, and, and will that be possible? What other, are there any soft sources for preservation, local sources for preservation, all that kind of stuff that we're going to be looking at to determine um, how we pursue uh, the, the recapitalization and, and, the, um, and the acquisition rehab. And with that, we again look at the market. As I mentioned before, what is, what can we achieve from an acquisition? And on a portfolio investment, a lot of times we can, um, we look at it both as the acquisition from the LP might generate equity to the, the owner um, and also as an opportunity to, to increase the financing. And I'll, I'll explain that just really briefly. Um, it's funny here, uh, David referred to the game of homes as not, you know, as as, as the pursuit of fee, fees where where uh, a housing is a byproduct. Well, it's it can often be not just fees, but it can also be equity. We can, um, if we have a property that's in an area that's appreciated and will appraise for a certain amount, we can often generate acquisition proceeds, you know, dollars for the purchase of that asset from one LP to the other or one GP to the other. So when we do the 4% transaction, we can acquire the property, um, settle some debt, and take actually take equity out of the, the property ostensibly, while at the same time generating credits um, through the acquisition credit that's part of that 4% credit for the rehab and for, for, the, for the property there. So we're going to look at it from not only does it generate development fees and recapitalize our property, but can it also generate... Um, some sales proceeds, basically, for the owner. And since we were the owner, um, it often works very well. We, and, and, and sometimes that's not possible, and we have to settle with, with putting up a note. But again, that acquisition note participates in increased credit. So that's a, very important to us. Um, and with that market and local opportunity, again, taxes are extremely important. If we have an existing property, that has, you know, at year 15, its pilot might be expiring because it was set up in a way that it, it mirrored the the, um, the tax credits. If it's starting to expire, what chance will that municipality or locality renegotiate a pilot with us? And that will have a tremendous impact on, on, a, on, a, on a preservation opportunity or project. Um, with that, will, or alternatively, do they have resources that they can offer to help support the acquisition rehab of a pro property. Um, are there home or other things that they want to see put into a property to ensure that it maintains affordability? I mean, that's a big concern for a lot of um, municipalities and, or, or areas where there's, some, so there's been a lot of appreciation and the opportunity for affordable housing in that area is, is going away. So they want to see that um, existing low-income opportunities maintained in those communities. And that's, you know, something that we work with the municipalities to ensure that we can continue to provide that, and they often are able to provide some resource, whether it's a continuation or a new pilot or it's actual uh, soft sources um, or other funding to help, you know, ensure that we can keep this as an affordable product. Um, Andrew, uh, we're running a bit behind in time, so if you can... I'm on my last I... slide. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, finally, uh, my example of this is that we, uh, we own a property 
in uh, Atlantic City called Brigantine Homes. We were able, as actually it was two um, properties, we were able to refinance them both at the same time. We were facing a 20-year extension of our Section 8 contract, and we, we had two properties adjacent to each other. We were able to put them under a single Section 8 contract and address the capital needs that, that, that had been found on the property. Um, it was also done at a time when New Jersey had just uh, announced its conduit bond financing. Um, so we were able to go out and use a private conduit um, lender in a way that we hadn't previously for a 4% tax credit development um, and able to take advantage of uh, some Freddie Mac credit enhancement in a way that the agency hadn't been previously. So we, got, we were able to generate more debt on the property, do more rehab. And as I mentioned before, the market opportunities, there was su sufficient um, acquisition proceeds to really generate a good, um, to cover all the existing soft debt we, we had put on the property and all existing debt we had on the property and generate a lot of tax credit equity for the project. So it was kind of a, a perfect um, opportunity for us to, to use something that was in our existing affordable housing portfolio and sign it up for another 30 years of affordability um, and address the capital needs on the project. And I will take questions as well with everyone else. Thank you so much, um, Andrew, and sorry to rush you there. Um, all right, so we're, we're going to probably run a little late behind in this. Um, I've had some questions asking about um, an archive of, of this recording, uh, this, of this webinar. This webinar will be archived, and um, the slides will be made available in PDF, and all that will be available on our website on our homepage, Multi-Housing News. So thank you so much for your presentation, Andrew. Our next speaker will be uh, David Schultz, Vice President of Development at one of the nation's largest nonprofit development companies, Community Housing Partners. David will address recap and preservation hey, from a nonprofit developer's point of view. He will explain one deal executed by CHP. Um, uh, which was a joint venture with a local housing authority and go over its ownership structure financing pro forma. David Schultz became Vice President of Development for uh, CHP in early 2001. In this role, David manages CHP's multifamily real estate development efforts throughout Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. Prior to joining CHP, David served as the Managing Director of Triad Companies in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he guided the development of more than 1,700 residential apartments and multiple commercial projects. He has also served as senior project manager for the Cornerstone Group in Coral Gables, Florida, supervising the development of 1,300 tax credit finance properties throughout the state. David graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, where he also completed postgraduate coursework at the University's Wharton School of Business. Uh, we're probably going to run a few minutes um, over, so uh, we're most pleased to include um, David Schultz on our panel. Welcome, David. David, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, one thing I'll just introduce our organization, Community Housing Partners. We are located in Virginia. We're a 40 year old organization. And as Keith was mentioning, we're the 10th largest nonprofit affordable housing developer in the U.S. We have a footprint that extends from Maryland down to Florida, uh, over 350 employees. We've completed in excess of 60, 60 plus light tech projects actively manage over 5,600 units, and we develop about $40 million per year. Uh, we perform construction, property management, and resident services and development, architecture and planning all in-house. So a little unique platform for a um, nonprofit housing developer. One thing um, that I introduce is some people may be wondering what the differences are and what makes uh, redevelopment or property redevelopment unique for a nonprofit? Uh, what do we look at differently than the for-profit entities? Uh, most of the time, I'd say absolutely nothing. Um, what makes or what constitutes a good opportunity for a for-profit organization also constitutes a, a good opportunity for a nonprofit organization. 
having come from the uh, for-profit world, I would say that there's probably a larger concentration on resident services and the ability to um, introduce or to enhance resident services post-completion. And that is where a uh, large focus of our organization uh, is. Most of the dollars that we generate um, are reinvested in the communities that we uh, manage. Um, the particular uh, project I'll discuss today um, really is an assembly of some of the uh, discussion that's happened before me from some of the panelists. It is a RAD project, a rental assistance demonstration project, which ended up being a joint venture between community housing partners and a local housing authority. In this case, it's a smaller uh, town here in Virginia called the Hopewell Redevelopment Housing Authority. Community Housing Partners was selected as the uh, town's master developer. And we are now doing the second RAD deal, but this particular one is the first RAD deal in that town. It was the first RAD development to close in Virginia. And it was very early in the RAD process, so I believe we were right around the 17th or 18th in the nation to close. Uh, we, per, we, we this project uh, combined a nine percent sub nine percent award of tax credits, RAD rental assistance, permanent loan, and soft funds to make the project uh, work. The particular projects, like most um, housing authority projects uh, that we've seen and enter the RAD program, was uh, built in the '60s, never had significant rehabilitation, um, and was. Uh, really an opportunity for us to come in there and address the capital needs of the project. Unfortunately, um, when we took a look at the financials of the projects, we took a look at how the RAD program would work, um, really presented an obstacle. Uh, the RAD rents are fixed. Sometimes those rents don't equate, e even with all the 9% subsidy, the RAD rents don't allow you to secure enough permanent mortgage debt to make a project feasible. In this case, um, since the project really did not have any significant rehabilitations from the 60s, uh, it, it, it proved better uh, in, for the outcome of the residents to move everyone off site, demolish 100% of the units, and rebuild a brand new project. So I guess before I get into the presentation, the moral of some of the recapitalizations are that sometimes a recapitalization ends up being a new construction. And that was the case here. Um, when we received our tax credit award, um, we formed a new entity, new partnership. CHP, because of our experience, was the managing member of this new ownership, and we will be for 15 years. After year 15, the housing authority will have the right to repurchase the property for outstanding debt and exit taxes from not only CHP, but from the limited partners. CHP on this project is also serving as the developer, general contractor, architect, property manager, and we perform our own tax credit compliance. In doing all of this, we have to make all the requisite guarantees, just like any for-profit tax credit developer would, where we guarantee construction completion and all operating deficits and tax credit compliance. Uh, in this partnership, the city of Hopewell and the housing authority worked hand-in-hand -hand, uh, to get us a tax abatement committed for the property for 15 years. Um, we had letters of support from uh, the city manager, which were very important in receiving a 9% tax credit award, uh, as well as being in the CRA, which allowed us to qualify for some low-interest financing. Uh, the city also, in this case, waived the building fees. This is a pic these are some pictures of the projects on the right side, at least on my right side of the screen. You can see the before, um, where the buildings were just uh, brick buildings with shed-style roofs, and we went in and enhanced the project clearly on the left. You can see we went back, and this is a during construction, so you can see some of the downspouts aren't yet completed. But we went in and completely you know, revitalized the property, took over a uh, city road, and went in and made brand new community for the residents. Uh, this is a picture, this is a rendering of uh, the site plan of the project. I know you don't, we don't have a before rendering, uh, but this is very, very true to what the project looks like. 
here are sources and uses uh, for the project and some of the more significant areas on our sources have arrows on it. Uh, the permanent fin financing which was provided by Bank of America. Um, this is very interesting. Some of the early RAT projects had some very, very difficulty getting uh, permanent financing from sources other than uh, FHA. Because of the RAD use agreements that are recorded, many lenders um, were reluctant to lend on RAD deals. I guess that was a byproduct that HUD didn't anticipate. Um, since that time, this was again one of the early RAD projects to close. Since that time, some of the lenders have gotten more comfortable with you know, some of the RAD riders that are now available through HUD. Um, I, I dare say that Bank of America, after we closed this deal, we, we went to a lunch and, together and they told us, uh, I didn't know that this project, they informed me that they nearly didn't close on this project because of the RAD use agreement. It was unbeknownst to me at the time. I would have, uh, I would have been a lot more nervous uh, than I was. But we had to complete, uh, we had to complete the project with several other sources. We received a home loan from the state. We received AHP funds from the Federal Home Loan Bank in Atlanta, coming through Bank of America. We also received an allocation of housing trust funds in Virginia. Um, we have a small deferred fee on this transaction, but. Very, very um, expensive transaction, um, total about $9.8 million, producing roughly 56 units. Um, we had to abate asbestos, uh, we had to abate lead paint, and we had some terrible soil conditions on the site, which we had to deal with. Some of the more interesting things on the top, you could see the assumptions, and I don't need to um, articulate what they all were. But one of the interesting things I mentioned earlier is that sometimes uh, the RAD rent alone and a permanent mortgage aren't enough. This was a project that had only 30 uh, RAD units um, that we demolished. When we looked at our sources and units, uh, sources and uses, and put together all of uh, the cash flow modeling that we did, the rents on the RAD units, as you can see. Are, 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 well, you can't see on this slide, but they're, they're very low. Uh, what we had to do is create a mixed income project here and do some mixed financing where we added straight light tech units. So on the bottom right of the screen, you can see that we had 30 units of PBRA, which is project-based rental assistance, which were the RAD units. We had to add 26 units of non-PBRA, which were straight we call them market market light tech, but they were um, non PBRA units. So there's no rental contract on 26 out of the 56 units. However, all 56 units are encumbered by tax credit restrictions. We did this because uh, we needed to fund the project. Uh, we went out to the market. We got our rent comp studies. We got our market surveys back, and it said that this is uh, this was feasible. Um, reproducing or, or knocking down 30 units and creating 30 units is a little small of a transaction to try to get done um, and it didn't just didn't produce um, the right amount of uh, the right amount of net operating income that we needed to support debt for this project and this is uh, what our stabilized pro forma looks like on the project um, I think what's important here to note is that you know, the projects do work, and the only reason, again, that this project was feasible was because of the introduction of the straight market light tech units to this RAD deal. And finally, just some numbers on this project. Um, if anyone, I'm sure probably people wondering what this is, but I'll just go through it. It took us 36 months to complete this transaction and get it financed, 14 months to build, 6 months to lease up, with a total of 56 months from start to finish. So uh, I think every presenter here could attest that projects have enormous life cycles. Um, nothing is quick. Uh, nothing is done quickly. Uh, allocations of tax credits don't happen that quickly. Getting soft debt does not happen quickly. And if anyone's in a rush um, to do a project, this is probably not the right business. Um, things just have very, very long life cycles. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll take questions and hand it back.
Thank you so much, David. Thanks so much for your presentation and that walkthrough. Uh, we're pleased to introduce our next speaker, Joshua Reese. Uh, Joshua's presentation will discuss recap deals from the lender's angle. He will provide guidance on what the developer needs to know from day one, explain the different types of executions and sources of financing. Joshua is an assistant vice president, president with Hunt Mortgage Group, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Hunt companies. Based in New York, uh, Mr. Reese is responsible for structuring and marketing the firm's platform of affordable housing loan products. Hunt Mortgage Group offers Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA executions, as well as proprietary financing for multifamily and most other commercial assets. Um, Joshua began his mortgage banking career with Hunt Mortgage Group in 2012, then called uh, Centerline Capital Group. Prior to joining the Affordable Housing Debt Group, he was an associate in the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Asset Management Group overseeing 50 LIHTC properties comprised of 5,000 plus units across 15 states. Before Centerline, Joshua spent two years at AIMCO as portfolio analyst and three years as Ma at Max Properties as an associate performing at an uh, performing analysis on acquisitions, dispositions, and financings. Joshua holds a Bachelor of Arts degree uh, in history from New York University. We're pleased to have Joshua on this panel today. Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Keith. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for dialing in and uh, joining us for the webinar. Uh, I'm excited to discuss the recap, preservation and recapitalization of LIHTC affordable housing from a lender's perspective. Now, some of our other uh, presenters um, on the panel discuss a number of different types of affordable housing and all the different steps that a LIHTC and affordable housing transaction has gone through during its life cycle. David uh, Schultz and Andrew Davenport touched on some of the different uh, ways that they approach these recapitalizations. From my perspective, I wouldn't be uh, approached or you probably won't approach your lender until you have uh, already identified a transaction that uh, at least makes sense on paper. Uh, ultimately, you will be um, approaching your lender and you want to provide them with certain information on day one. You want to be able to determine uh, really what your business plan is um, and whether you're planning on repositioning the property um, or you're just trying to uh, take over an asset that has uh, deferred maintenance or complicated uh, financing um, and rework those either through uh, you know, adding in new equity um, in a recycle of the tax credits or bringing in new private financing to take out the, the old and at times uh, expensive debt uh, on some of these properties, specifically properties that were uh, financed in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Some of the bond deals especially have interest rates well above 7%, and uh, many of those properties uh, ultimately struggled uh, just due to that additional debt service um, each year. So what I would like to know each time is what the goal is, what your timing constraints are in terms of when you're planning on executing your acquisition of the property. Do you currently own it with existing financing? When the existing financing matures or when the um, existing financing is open for prepayment? Are you contemplating capital improvements? And if you are ca uh, contemplating capital improvements, it, we would try to get an idea day one what you're looking to spend on a per unit basis and the types of uh, capital expenditures you're seeking to uh, perform at the property. Um, as well, one thing I would want to know is whether you value proceeds or speed and ease of execution. There are a number of different um, loan products available that can produce extremely high proceeds, um, specifically geared towards affordable housing. And 
There are others that are just uh, geared towards the acquisition uh, and preservation of property, uh, affordable housing property. And, uh, you know, we would try to determine what your, your hot buttons are so that we can go down the, the correct path from day one and we're not, um, we don't waste your time or, uh, you know, the agency's time trying to uh, provide an execution that just won't work. The way I see uh, a lot of these recapitalization deals is I would try to end up um, cla classifying or categorizing them into one-step recapitalization or two-step or multiple-step recapitalization. The uh, one-step recapitalization are primarily deals with um, either uh, year 10 or year 11 deals during the live tax period where you have to hold the, the property uh, under this existing use agreement uh, for at least another five years before you can seek new tax credits. Or there are uh, other options where, you know, for the most part, the property might just operate extremely well with these use restrictions, with the uh, affordability gap between either LIHTC rents or the affordable uh, rents for, uh, in that market. Um, or, you know, this could just be a, uh, PBRA deal where you're sitting on some strong cash flow um, and uh, you're pretty happy with uh, just realizing annual cash flow. So one reason that I would want to categorize a, a deal or you might look to see uh, a deal as a one-step recapitalization and seek financing um, for that execution immediately would be the long-term fixed interest rate that uh, you know, an agency or FHA can provide day one. Uh, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac um, can provide uh, 10, 12, 15, or 30-year um, money uh, with 30-year amortization. FHA, on the other hand, can provide up to 85% of your loan to the value and provide you an extremely um, low interest rate. If you are going through a one-step recapitalization or you do plan on doing some additional uh, repositioning of the property, you do believe that there's going to be some uh, additional upside in NOI during the term of the loan, you have the ability, especially with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to seek um, a supplemental financing uh, through their supplemental uh, loan program, which can allow you to take out up to 80% um, of the value at that time after the first year of the loan. Many of these programs also have the built-in ability to finance um, moderate or substantial rehab rehabilitation. Um, I would like to highlight a few of these products. Uh, Fannie Mae has an affordable housing preservation loan, which generally can range between five to 10 years. These could be um, any type of uh, affordability, whether it's a live tech deal, whether it is a PBRA contract. Now you're just pretty much looking to put long-term uh, fixed rate money uh, on it and uh, operate it accordingly and pretty much sit it on the, the cash flow as uh, you would any other cash and carry transaction. Fannie Mae also recently um, rolled out and seized up its Green Preservation Plus loan. The Green Preservation Plus loan will uh, allow you to finance up to 85% of the loan to value and loan to cost. These transactions, um, which you would generally uh, perhaps shy away from when you see the green um, moniker in the tagline, most of the repairs or many of the repairs that you would seek to perform on these properties um, that are 15 or 20 years old, many of them will ultimately uh, fall under and be approved under this Green Preservation Plus loan. For the most part, if you're replacing appliances, most developers or borrowers of ours seek to place um, Energy Star appliances in there anyway. Many um, borrowers or developers are seeking to put new windows and new insulation and water-saving devices 
at the properties. All of these can be approved, um, and it's a generally a very quick and easy additional step of just having an additional um, addenda to the PCA, which would highlight the different high performance business. business uh, I apologize. High performance uh, building improvements that you are seeking to add to the property. Freddie Mac has their own targeted affordable preservation loans that uh, range from five to 10 years. Uh, generally, they have uh, pretty good terms and uh, certainly in top markets or with uh, deeper skewing of affordability, uh, you'll see Freddie Mac get extremely aggressive on terms and rates. That leads me to FHA. FHA has two main loan products that uh, would fall under the, the recapitalization uh, lending product, one being the 223F loan, which can get up to 85% for live tech property. This loan program has a 35-year term and a 35-year amortization, which results in interest rates today below 3.5%. Uh, effective uh, amortization content, constants of uh, just over five and a quarter percent. Uh, I mean, as, as compared to uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, I mean, this is probably the cheapest money out there today and can really maximize your cash flow. Built within the 223F program is also a uh, the ability to finance up to $6,500 uh, per unit um, across the country in certain high cost markets that can uh, grow to about uh, $13,000. But that would also uh, cap you at the replacement of one building system. If you need to do more rehab, uh, the FHA 221D4 is an excellent execution. It does take some time, but it results in a 40-year term with 40-year amortization. And uh, you can finance a large, uh, portion of your rehab, probably more so than any other product available on the market today. Interest rates on that are, are generally only 50 basis points above the 223F. So you, you, you'd be looking at an interest rate um, just about 4% today. Other times there's going to be um, an opportunity to execute a two-step repositioning where perhaps you're going to acquire an asset that has um, significant deferred maintenance. It might have, uh, you might be seeking to acquire a property and uh, go through the steps for a 4% tax credit resyndication, or you might be um, acquiring an asset with an existing long-term um, PPRA contract, a half contract, and seek a markup to our market and increase your rent up to um, up to where the market rents are, or very close to that. Many times, our borrowers are able to um, execute these markup to markets and significantly increase the uh, both the NOI and the resulting value of their property. Both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac see this need for shorter term financing products that have a lot of flexibility for these two-step repositioning. Specifically, Freddie Mac just recently rolled out a value-add loan. The value-add loan is interesting because it's a three-year term with an option for a 12-month extension. The three-year term comes with a full-term interest only and no cap is required, as this is a variable rate loan. Generally, with other variable rate loans, you're going to require to uh, come to the table with a third-party cap or pay for an embedded third-party cap or an embedded cap from uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which ends up being pretty costly. Another uh, item that is extremely interesting about this deal, uh, this new product, is that there's no lockout. You can prepay the deal at any time during the three years. The pricing on this is extremely attractive, and I, I continue to see uh, Freddie Mac um, get 
even more aggressive on uh, their pricing as uh, they want to build out their market share with this product. In terms of prepayment uh, penalties, while there's no lockout, there is an exit fee. Uh, the exit fee would be waived if you choose to refinance the property uh, with a new fixed term Freddie Mac loan. This product is not assumable, assumable. So for instance, if you purchase the property and you seek to sell it within those first three years, um, it would have to be paid off um, with the exit fee. The sizing is based on a seven-year fixed loan, which would generally result in proceeds of about 80, uh, usually result in a proceeds of about 80% loan to value. This product, though, comes with the ability to finance up to 85% of loan to value or your loan to cost. The product also has a built-in uh, capability where you can rehab up to $15,000 per unit. You must, to qualify for this, this loan product, you must uh, invest up to $5,000 per unit of rehab, of which 50% of the rehab uh, needs to be spent on unit interiors. Recently, uh, res probably resulting from Freddie Mac's um, increased advertisement and, and publicity around the value add loan, Fannie Mae, rolled out their 7-4 ARM. The 7-4 ARM product is a seven-year term, which can finance up to 80% loan to value. These loans could be converted at any point to a uh, fixed rate loan without penalty. Like their old 7-6 ARM product uh, that you'd see both on the, the market rate side and on the affordable side, there's a one-year lockout and 1% prepayment penalty thereafter. So you're generally um, constrained to the types of repairs or the level of rehab that you seek to do. Another interesting product that has really yet penetrated the affordable housing market is traditional bridge financing. Over this last year, Hunt Mortgage has rolled out a uh, bridge product specifically geared towards bridging uh, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac fixed rate execution. So we would finance up to 80% loan to value or loan to cost as we pursue or as you pursue a fixed rate execution within that first year or up to two years thereafter with either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. We can close extremely quickly with a very attractive pricing generally in the, let's call it four and a half percent. I apologize for running through a lot of these loan products. I know we're pinched for time, and I appreciate everybody, uh, everybody's attention. Recently, as uh, some of our other uh, panelists discussed, we have uh, the industry as a whole has been uh, pretty much uh, focused on the RAD program over the last two years. I had the uh, distinct opportunity to work on, so far, the largest uh, RAD execution to date with the Housing Authority of the City of El Paso, Texas, which uh, really allowed us to glean some insights for how these properties uh, need to be approached going forward. I believe, especially on the development side, there is a huge opportunity for developers, the developers or long-term uh, or, or, or individuals seeking a long-term participation in these deals to partner with housing authorities who lack the capability to develop these types of executions in-house. Once you have the, the, the I mean, in, as David uh, Smith touched on, there's 180,000 uh, units um, that are currently uh, going through this process, and that uh, represents only a mere fraction of the overall opportunity. I think the entire um, the entire industry anticipates that this demonstration, this short-term demonstration, will be renewed either uh, to include and enlarge the uh, eligible uh, number of units or to ultimately make this a permanent program. From our experience in working with the HACEP transaction, we really were able to uh, get a, a good idea of what we needed to know going forward starting day one. 
the first thing we need to know is what the rents are and whether the housing authority, because in certain cases these CHAP rents are going to be relatively low, we need to know whether the housing authority has the ability or the wherewithal to provide an additional subsidy over and above these CHAP rents. Another, another instance of uh, you know, information that you want to try to determine immediately is if you're pursuing a 4% transaction and there's going to be uh, resident relocation during the rehab period, uh, you need to know what the RAD rehab rents are. RAD rehab rents are, are strictly what the properties will continue to receive during that initial year. Um, and usually during that initial year of rehab, uh, much of these properties will continue to see strong cash flow during the rehab period as uh, even in the, in the event of vacancy by a tenant, you will receive approximately two-thirds of the uh, RAD rehab rent, um, which continues to uh, allow you to use that as a source of funds that would uh, ultimately allow you to carry more debt and uh, defer less fees. Another thing that we, we really had to uh, grapple with is the as-is and as-stabilized expenses, as the operations for these properties were basically flipped on their head with uh, a reduction in payroll and staffing and a reduction, a significant reduction in R&M and admin costs as the property transitions from the public housing operational model to one of a essentially a for-profit entity. Um, Joshua, can we um, wrap this up in five minutes? We're, we're running yes. um, seriously behind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Another thing, uh, many of these housing authorities have the ability to provide gas financing, and that is going to be a central key to the sources of many of these deals, as many of them won't support as much uh, hard debt as uh, other types of LIPEX transactions. As I discussed, we were involved and we financed the HACEP Tranche 1 transaction. As David Schultz mentioned with his experience with Bank of America, uh, many private lenders have had uh, problems executing on these uh, financing as they've been grappling with the use agreement. We had the first uh, Freddie Mac RAD loan to ever close, uh, and it was a $59.6 million Freddie Mac tax exempt loan. The tax exempt loan is effectively a private placement loan where the Freddie Mac purchases the bond directly or a loan directly from the housing authority. This provides long term, extremely aggressive pricing. In the case of uh, our transaction, uh, the loan was priced at 237 over the 10-year treasury, which is uh, comparable to some 10-year you know, money that's uh, currently being offered or in uh, what resulted in an 18-year loan with 35-year amortization. For this transaction, we were able to finance with one mortgage 13 non-contiguous properties comprised of 1,590 units of public housing. We had a phenomenal partner in the housing authority of the city of El Paso, Texas, who had the ability and the vision to rely on both their existing capital and private money in the form of tax credits and uh, private funding in terms of uh, A bonds, which were the tax exempt loans. We used B bonds in this capital stack, which uh, effectively allowed um, a bridge of the tax credit equity. We had a HACEP gap loan, which the, uh, the housing authority were further able to bridge the tax credit equity, resulting in a higher yield to the investor and better pricing uh, of the tax credit to the housing authority. As well, they uh, created a seller loan, which created more basis, uh, resulting in additional credit. And uh, the strong cash flow of the property uh, as well resulted in um, increased ability to uh, rely on um, additional hard debt. 
as uh, we approach other transactions in this manner, uh, we are going to seek to provide the most aggressive pricing with our, our Freddie Mac and uh, seek to do as many of these deals as possible as there's a huge opportunity for both us and um, all the other people participating in this loan. Just want to thank everyone, and I'll take some questions with the uh, other panelists. Thank you so much, um, Joshua. So we're coming to the um, question and answer. Um, there are a couple of questions we have. I'll, all right, I'll put up the first question out there. What are the latest strategies in mitigating income tax issues for sellers? What are the latest strategies in mitigating income tax issues for sellers? Is, um, is there anyone uh, on the panel that can comment on this? I can do this if you'd like, Keith. Okay, great. This is David Smith. There's a paradox here. In order to get volume cap bonds, there has to be a real estate transaction with a different taxpayer. Uh, that, in other words, the new taxpayer has to have its own basis, which means the old taxpayer cannot carry in the property the basis. They cannot carry the basis over. So, tenant in common. 1031 exchange, that kind of transaction that you're used to for deferring contingent tax um, is not available. Uh, which means, by the way, that the discussion you heard before about purchase price becomes so relevant because the seller has to get enough cash not only to pay for the capital gain on the cash portion, but also to deal with the lock in tax. There is some consolation when you have corporate investors as limited partners because for many of them the tax liability has already been carried on the books and within the internal allocation within the bank they can normally absorb it and not care about it. But the short answer to your question, um, you pay the tax. Thank you David. Okay, um, what is a typical yield maintenance period on the LIHTC loan um, that is, how long until you can refinance without paying a prepayment penalty on the primary mortgage? That's a quick um, question, I guess. I, I could take that. This is Josh Reese from Hunt Mortgage Group. Okay. Um, primarily, these transactions, if you're starting from day one as a new LIHTC deal, whether it's a 9% uh, or a 4% deal, the yield maintenance period is going to be structured unless it's previously negotiated so that the, the yield maintenance period burns off at or uh, perhaps six months prior to the end of the 15-year compliance period to allow flexibility for the exit of the property. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. How can an administrative co-general partner ensure that the LIHTC deals lenders will accept their guarantee to allow the original managing partner to exit the deal um, and be relieved of their guarantee? So let me just read that again. How, how can an administrative co-general partner ensure that the um, lender will accept their guarantee to allow the original management partner to exit the deal? Don't borrow money from the lender who doesn't say yes. <laughs> That's correct. Okay, so, so some lenders will, will accept that. Okay, and how do Fannie and Freddie define preservation? Does it have to have subsidy or can it be straight LIHTC with time left on the extended use agreement or still uh, in the compliance period? So Fannie and Freddie, um, for the most part, they define preservation as prop affordable housing properties that currently maintain use restrictions in some form or fashion at 40 at 60 percent of AMI or below for a minimum of 40 percent of the unit. This could come in, in many different flavors, whether it's a, an existing uh, LIHTC deal during, let's call it the first 15 years of the compliance period, or it could be a PBRA um, deal, which uh, you know, is during the 
20-year contract and is currently subject to those use restrictions that uh, fall alongside the, the, the half contract. Okay. Thank you. And uh, how long does it typ typically take to close on a FHA loan? Uh, that generally depends on the um, HUD office and also depends on uh, what you're trying to accomplish. If it's a 223F loan, HUD, HUD is supposed to be able to issue a commitment within three months of receiving the firm application. We have seen transactions take uh, as little as two months from that stage, and that's uh, following the receipt of the third party. And we've also seen them take um, significantly longer, um, uh, upwards of about eight months, as uh, you know, the borrower, the lender being us, and uh, FHA were negotiating a number of terms and, and issues, uh, which resulted in, in many delays. Um, Generally, I would ballpark it to three to five months on a 223F, and on a D4, you're looking anywhere between um, nine months uh, from start to finish to uh, upwards of a year. Okay. Th thanks, Joshua. Um, next question. Can the speaker suggest a rehab program for old 236 um, smaller projects, 10 to 15 units? Most seem to be cost prohibitive from an underwriting standpoint, fees and so on. Uh, Keith, this is David Smith. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll speak for my two developer colleagues um, who can then correct me. Uh, okay. You have to find a way to aggregate them um, because as the questioner clearly understands, all of the HUD programs and for that matter when you overlay tax credit and or RAD and or some other form of preservation onto an existing HUD program, um, they have substantial entropies of small scale. Uh, one of the collections of orphan properties, in fact, are these clusters of 10, 12, 15, 20 properties, 20 unit properties, because it is not, the question is absolutely right, it's not economic. So that's where Andrew Davenport made reference to portfolio acquisitions. It is possible, it's becoming increasingly possible, if HUD is not the mortgagee, if somebody else is the mortgagee of the new transaction, then in effect you make a macro scattered site project. Um, I think Josh was alluding to that in his Freddie Mac portfolio, that you actually put 13 individual properties under one aggregated Freddie Mac revolver. Um, you have to get beyond the special purpose vehicle for the itty bitty property because otherwise you are stuck. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'll, I'll take this last question. There is some activity in the utility conservation site that significantly impacts NOI. Um, are there loans specific to that, like the Green Preservation Plus? Does, um, can, can anyone answer that or make sense of that question? There's some activity in the utility conservation site that significantly impacts NOI. Are there loans specific to that, like the Green Preservation Plus? I mean, there, there are and there aren't. Um, the Green Preservation Plus would allow you to finance the, um, the actual capital expenditure um, up to 85% of the total cost of your, your acquisition uh, of the project and the investment in the capital expenditures. Though you end up um, not being able to really realize that additional NOI growth or uh, savings until you are, are able to execute a supplemental loan. But once you have the supplemental loan uh, product, you usually you're able to do that about 12 months out. Um, you can realize a, a, a significant portion of that uh, NOI growth and that, that growth in value. Um, so I, I would go with that tax. Or, or you would do the, the value add loan um, that Freddie Mac has and, uh, you know, prepay that with uh, no fee if you take that out with a new Freddie Mac loan. Um, you'll be able to realize up to 70, well, actually, with Freddie Mac, up to 80% of that value. One other thing is look to your state. Your state may have a program specifically for green features, whereas a lot of soft sources have dried up. 
green features might be one where there is some funny funding and we've been able to go to them for whether it's uh, smaller you know programs to specifically address one system whether it's including green energy or efficiency um, and able to 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 provide to get a, a small source of soft financing for a rehab that you can't find for new construction or somewhere else but the basic the, the underlying thing is that there is no such thing as performance based underwriting right now in the hard debt arena for a variety of reasons that represented in my not so humble opinion a market failure uh, we've been trying to crack this problem for several years Fannie's green preservation plus is progress in that direction uh, but I think that was David Schultz saying, in effect, go to a motivated lender like your state or a soft debt provider because they're the only ones who will um, help you try to underwrite against the net NOI boost that we believe will be there if the gadgets work. Yeah, it, it was Andy, but yes, and, and my second thought on that is um, you may be able to use it to change your utility allowance. We've, we've also had a limited success with that where you're able to increase um, decrease the utility allowance because you can demonstrate that what's published um, doesn't reflect what you'll actually achieve with your property with the green features installed. Yeah, that you can do, but that is of limited help in the underwriting phase. Uh, it, it just gets you a little, a few more dollars on the operating. Yep. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all our panelists for um, answering the questions and thank you to everyone for their patience. Uh, we went over the time limit. This webcast is being recorded and um, the PowerPoint presentations will be available on Multi Housing News homepage in about, uh, within a week. Click on the webinars tab located on the left hand side of the Multi Housing News homepage. We would like to thank our panel speakers, David Smith, Andrew Davenport, David Schultz, and Joshua Rees for their great presentations. And thank you to all of you for joining us. This concludes our webcast.